Thank you all very much for coming to tonight's film screenings. Uh, my name is Emma Moore, I'm the curatorial assistant for the public programme here, um, and I'm really happy and quite excited about the films that we, um, in conversation with Geoffrey Farmer, have selected to screen tonight. So, uh, unfortunately, um, Geoffrey's not here to make the introduction, so I thought, in the spirit of uh, Geoffrey Farmer channeling Frank Zappa, I would channel Geoffrey Farmer and make an introduction to some um, previous works that he has, he has made, which hopefully will illuminate for you um, why perhaps he has chosen some of these films and give more of a context to his, to his practice. Um, so I'll make an introduction, which will be around maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll go ahead and just screen the three films. So in order of appearance, um, with Ballet Mechanique, uh, then Asparagus, and finishing with Punch and Judy. And they're roughly around 10 to 15 minutes each, so we should be finished, I imagine, um, about 20 to 8 or so. Uh, so I've selected a couple of works um, by Geoffrey Farmer, and I'd like to start with um, this piece called A Pale Fire Freedom Machine from 2005. So the installation was made in um, the power plant in Toronto. And uh, Geoffrey has taken the title from Vladimir Nabokov's 1962 novel, A Pale Fire, and this is something that you will kind of see reoccur throughout um, Jeffy Farmer's practice as a very strong literary um, influence. Um, the installation, as you can see, is quite, um, it's quite impressive and it really maybe pushes what um, a sculptural installation can be. So it was made up of um, a lot of discarded furniture, which was assembled in these kind of strange um, ways in the gallery. Um, surround, or surrounding the um, fireplace in the centre. Um, so the furniture was then uh, disassembled in a workshop here. Um, so as it was all taken apart, it was then, then fed into this fire. And um, the soot that was generated from the fire, from burning the furniture, was then in turn turned into ink. And the ink was used to print posters. And I should mention here that the fire was initially started by a poster which um, the artist found on one of the um, discarded pieces of furniture. So it has quite a nice cyclical process in that the work sort of feeds into itself and um, it has um, a strong idea of um, process and duration and this is happening, of course, over the course of um, the exhibition. And the, um, the fireplace, which is in the centre, is quite interesting. Um, it was taken inspiration from Dominique Imberg, who was... Um, an academic who was very much involved in his um, academia, but then suddenly abandoned that and moved to the country and um, took up ironmongering. And why he's famous, perhaps, for this work is that it was the first fireplace that would rotate 365 degrees, so it could be placed in the centre of the room and then everybody could sit almost anywhere around it. So when you start to look into all of the different aspects of the work, you can really fall into this spiral of the, the backstory or all of the references that Jeffrey is constantly pulling to, uh, to make his work. Um, so the next piece, which is where I initially um, encountered uh, Jeffrey Farmer's work, and which is maybe where he came to prominence for a lot of people, was in his rather immense installation at Documented 13. So it was called uh, Leaves of Grass. Again, this title was taken from um, a Walt Whitman book um, of poetry, which supposedly took him his whole life to write. So it becomes, again, this very uh, long, durational process. So the installation, uh, which ran the length of this quite spectacular hallway in Dinew Gallery uh, in Castle, and it was lit on one side by natural light, by all these windows, which ran the length of the, the corridor. So the um, installation is made up of quite meticulously cut out uh, figures and images from Life magazine over the course. It was taken from 50 years' worth of Life magazine from, sorry, between 1935 and 1985. So all the figures cut out and then assembled on little spikes and then put together to form this um, quite strange, enormous collage almost, um, which tells the, the American landscape over 50 years, you know, the cultural and social landscape. And it's quite interesting as you move down the hallway and you, you watch all of the figures and the way that it's assembled, you're, 
you're really seeing how the, the country and the, the social landscape was changing. So even through colour printing and then when it changed from black and white to colour and the density of the paper, the texture of the paper. And interestingly, they were saying that um, the natural light, how that affected some of the pieces as well through the different types of paper that would have been printed on. So this again would have taken an enormous amount of work and over a very long period of time. And in essentially 2D form in that all of the pieces are um, 2D works but then assembled in a 3D um, installation. So you can see how the pieces have all been put together and right down the bottom are these little tiny figures or tiny objects that have all been cut out and, and placed quite delicately in the installation. Another shot of the work. So, moving from um, the 2D works at Documenta, you know, in essence, each of the pieces being a 2D, a 2D work. Um, Jeffrey also showed quite recently um, at the in the Curve Gallery in the Barbican Centre in London, which some of you may may know. So, the figures that he was working on for the Documenta piece suddenly become inflated, and they're almost like puppets. So the collages and the images that have been assembled are suddenly dressed and made to look like these 3D figures and assembled almost like an army perched on plinths and are immediately imposing when you come into the space. So again, you navigate around the plinth, around all of these, some quite menacing, some sinister, some appearing quite friendly and nice, but once you turn you turn the corner and you see the other side, there's something perhaps darker happening. So as you move down through the installation, there's also a soundtrack which plays behind the work, which is made up of clicks of the camera or of a ticking clock. So um, slightly more gentle perhaps than the uh, soundtrack which accompanies the work upstairs. But this piece took three years to complete. And the collage and assemblage is drawing on a tradition, uh, perhaps um, drawing influence from Dadist uh, collagist Hannah Hock and Robert Rauschenberg. And the element of chance with the soundtrack which accompanied it was um, inspired by John Cage and also Merce Cunningham, uh, the famous choreographer, which I really like because these pieces, um, they take on a more animated form, so they look as if they are almost about to move. And this is perhaps enhanced by it being a 3D, a 3D object and appearing quite like puppets. And this is something that um, occurs throughout Jeffrey Farmer's work, I think, is the, the animist idea that these objects could be imbued with a spirit and that they look as if they are almost about to move but still retain something of a very, of a very thingness. So uh, Jan Verwert, the writer, talks about the materialist and animism in Jeffrey Farmer's work and Jan will be speaking here um, in a couple of weeks so if you want to hear more about that you'll have to come back in two Tuesdays time um, and this is also interesting in relation to the selection of Punch and Judy which many of you will know um, as probably the most famous puppet in history and I think the first time when Punch or when he made his debut was in 1660 so you're talking about a, uh, enormously long history of uh, puppetry. So the, all of the figures are, as I mentioned, some quite strange, some a little bit scary. There's, Jeffrey talks about shamans and uh, shapeshifters. And uh, the idea that they could move is, again, uh, quite important, I think, in this, in this work. So there's 365 figures also um, contained in the piece. And then at the very end of the room, there's a large projection, which is um, images projected of them in their entirety. So before they had been cut up and spliced and placed together in strange, um, in strange ways, you can see the whole images projected quite quickly um, at the back of the room. And the title for the piece, which you can see at the bottom here, The Surgeon and the Photographer, um, again, it's taken from a, a literary perspective, I suppose, from um, a Walter Benjamin essay um, in the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, where he draws 
um, similarities between the surgeon and the photographer in terms of making work. So where the, the surgeon um, cuts and splices, I guess, into humans, the photographer can do this with the camera in cutting um, images and placing things together in that respect. So there's just a close-up of one of the works. So you can see how they are just slightly kind of made to think of the uncanny. There's something re quite unsettling about them, but you know, you can see it's a dog, but there's something very much wrong with his, with his eye. <laughs> and that brings us up to um, the work which is showing upstairs. Uh, let's make the water turn black, which um, I believe that this is the third iteration of this piece. So it was originally started as a, an installation at the Red Cat in Los Angeles. And then it um, has traveled to Migros, which is where it was shown before it came here. So it has changed slightly in that the soundtrack is constantly reworked, the images or the, the pieces constantly being uh, reconfigured by Jeffrey Farmer and his uh, team of technicians. So many of you will have seen the exhibition upstairs and will have a sense of, of um, what it's like. But here's an image of the installation. And the title is taken from a Frank Zappa track. And this idea of um, appropriating somebody else or another identity is an, another thing which emerges quite frequently in Jeffrey Farmer's practice. And I believe that he, he talks about how he um, was taught by the writer Kathy Acker in San Francisco. And she's a very interesting figure in that um, in her writing she would appropriate historical figures or she would quite blatantly plagiarise or appropriate others' writings and piece these things together um, to form narratives that were more uh, personal to her. To her. Um, and Jeffrey, I think, is very much influenced by her work and also her having taught him. And th there is an interesting piece that he did in 2001, which I, tr I tried to find photographs of, but I couldn't find any images, um, called Katrina Jeffrey's Katrina. And Katrina Jeffries is uh, Jeffrey Farmer's gallerist, so already there's a play on, play on both of their identities there. Before that piece, um, he donned a black wig and almost impersonated his gallerist, and he was using this as a way to um, explore ideas of feminist practice in the 1970s, but by appropriating um, his gallerist identity. So it's quite playful, but also um, as a way to deal with quite serious issues. Um, and in this work, he, he often mentions the cut-up technique, which is what Kathy Acker almost borrowed from William, William Burroughs. And I think you can see it again in this 3D assemblage in that um, all of the objects are, are placed together, are cut, cut up and placed together in interesting ways. And a lot of the objects that he uses have been taken from um, or bought from a prop shop which was going out of business in Vancouver. And Vancouver is often called the Hollywood of the North in that there's so much film so much of the film industry there, but this enormous factory that was, or warehouse that was housed all of these um, props was going out of business, and he talked about it being like a strange museum. So this ethnographic approach to working with these objects that were telling a story, you know, they already have a history. Um, they've been obviously used and they're discarded, and props will inhabit that strange liminal space between when they're not being used and they're lying idle, they're, they're almost obsolete. So he's He's repurposing purposing them, and um, again, the soundtrack is a very important element to the work. So that runs over the course of the day and changes each hour and is made up of um, a huge amount of recordings. So these can be archival recordings or um, almost like sound effects. And I know that um, music on Crec was an interesting or an important influence on the work as well. The idea of recording sounds but removing them from their source so you separate the audio from the visual and and then reuse them in a in a different way and this is something that you'll see in the ballet mechanique which it, at the time in the 1920s when it was first shown was um, hugely controversial in that this sound soundtrack was so experimental that people didn't really know what to make of it and the first time it was shown in Paris, I think, in 1926. There was almost riots in the street. People were so angry with, um, with what they were listening to. Um, so that gives you a little bit of background, maybe to Geoffrey Farmer's practice,
some pre previous projects and there's some things maybe that um, we can keep in mind when watching the films that uh, will again sort of inform perhaps why he's chosen them. So as I mentioned he's very heavily influenced by literature um, he's playing quite often with the idea of the pervasiveness of um, the theatrical in everyday life or in our, in our cultural history and um, that maybe is something that speaks particularly to the asparagus film. It's completely almost psychedelic, it's very strange imagery, but in a very everyday setting, in that it's just in a house with um, the lone protagonist who's a faceless woman. Um, also dealing with expanded notions of sculpture and of performance. Um, I think revealing the making of his work whilst producing the work is something quite interesting as well. Some of you may have seen um, Jeffrey and his two technicians working in the gallery space. Um, to install this piece. So there, but for this one in particular, then all of the mechanics or the nerve system which allows the piece to breathe is all hidden under the platform which all the um, objects sit on. Um, material animism and the sense that these objects are things but that they could almost come to life and that's interesting perhaps in relation to the Punch and Judy film which is quite humorous but also a little bit strange and the puppets are very much alive while they're being animated, but when they're not, they just um, lying a bit still are a little bit well, creepy. Um, and then sound, again, very important. The work upstairs, Jeffrey will quite often refer to it as a sound piece, and that the visuals in the gallery, are they act as a means to entice the viewer to stay and to listen to the, the soundtrack that accompanies it. So just to give you a little bit of background on each of the films, um, the first film is Ballet Mécanique, which is from 1924, and is a masterpiece of early experimental filmmaking. And you can see in how the shots are composed that it is very, very experimental in um, what the art artists were, were doing. So it was a collaboration between Dardis Ferdinand uh, Leisure and cinematographer Dudley Murphy and uh, the American composer George Antiel. It's quite complicated or confusing as to how the piece... In its, in its full sense, came about. The, um, the film and the musical score, it's not entirely clear which came first, but the musical score ended up being almost twice as long as the film. So it's very rarely been screened or been shown in, um, in its entirely finished with both audio and, and visual um, components. And um, a print of the film was found by um, Leger's wife, a 35 mil print of it, and this was then handed over to Jonas Mikas, who was one of the founding members of the Anthology Film Archives. And this began the very long and laborious process of um, digitally remastering the work and combining it with the soundtrack. So it is quite exciting that we're actually screening it here this evening in, um, in its entirely finished form. Um, the second film then is... Uh, Susan Pitt's Asparagus from 1979, which is completely bizarre. <laughs> it was often shown um, before David Lynch, uh, Lynch's Eraserhead, and that's um, where it became quite, became quite famous in the cult underground scene. Um, Susan Pitt was originally a painter, and that's, that's quite apparent in the very rich and textured feel to the, to the work. Um, it's very surreal and dreamlike, which sort of reminds me upstairs a little bit in that the exhibition is quite a, a dreamlike scenario that you find yourself in. Um, very intense colour, and she uses varying methods of animation, um, which add a feeling of density almost to the work, in that it's very multi-layered. She used claymation and multi-layered cell animation to create this very visually rich imagery. And again, she's drawing on the history of marionette theatre and puppetry, but focusing on a soul somewhat lost figure. Um, and I suppose the idea of theatre and stage and when she goes backstage and what happens then, it releases all of these inner, inner feelings and interesting uh, imagery. I don't want to say too much about the films, though, because I think you just need to watch them and maybe bear in mind some of the things around um, Geoffrey Farmer's work. And then finally, um, Punch and Judy from 1966 um, by the Czech animator Jan Svankmeyer. So Svankmeyer studied puppetry in the Faculty of uh, Dramatic Arts at the Prague School. Um, he interestingly speaks of puppetry as a protection from the programs of reality. So he sees it almost completely removed from, from reality and as a way, as an escapism, I suppose. 
Um, something to bear in mind, perhaps, while watching this film is the juxtaposition of the puppets, which are obviously fake and not real, with the real-life animal. And there's something very strange that happens there. Um, so that's a little bit about each of the films, a little bit about um, Jeffrey Farmer's previous work. Um, I will be here for a little while afterwards. If you do have any questions, I can't say that I'll be able to answer them um, from Jeffrey Farmer's perspective, but I'll certainly try and answer them uh, from my own. And so I hope you enjoyed them, and thank you all very much for coming.